love coming to this church, love the worship, love the diversity of music and ages and backgrounds of the people that are involved. This is what the church is, amen? Well, our pastor, our pastor took a fall. How many can remember the first fall they took when they realized I'm not young anymore? <laughs> yeah, I remember it. It was a busy street corner. There were cars going by. When I was young, I would have thought about, this doesn't look very cool, and I would have bounced straight back up. However, I had just gotten a full coffee. I was laying on the sidewalk looking at that coffee, thinking, that's a really good lid. It didn't come off, and I didn't care whether I looked cool or not. So if you think about it, pray for our pastor, because he does not call me Sunday morning and say, I cannot make it. He does not. This is what he lives for. So if you would, and why don't we do that? Why don't we pray now? and uh, ask God blessing, uh, God's blessing on this time and also on this message. Father, we, uh, we thank you, Father, for the praise that we can sing because of the God that you are. We thank you, Lord, for this morning, for this place to come and meet, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we thank you for our pastor. Pray, Lord, that you'd heal his body, that you'd bring him up, uh, raise him up quickly. We know he hates to be down and idle. And he hates not being here. So, Father, we thank you for him. We pray, Lord, that he has a restful day. Uh, and we just pray, Lord, that you'd bring him back to us quickly. Father, for this time, for this time in your word, we just ask you, Lord, that you'd bless it, that you'd honor your word, Lord, and that your spirit would move here in our hearts and amongst us, Lord, and that you'd speak to our hearts, Father, that we could become more and more like our precious Savior. And, Father, we'll thank and praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this is a message that I did um, a couple of months back, uh, actually in a nursing home, and it was something that God had uh, placed on my heart. I, I don't know about you, but God, I can tell what God's working on in me because there tends to be a theme, and for a couple of years there tends to be a theme, and the theme is my, lately for me, is where's my focus? And it kind of leads into Sherry's Bible study. You know, if I'm the type of person, I don't know about you, but if I, can, if I watch a lot of news and I hear a lot of talk shows, oh, <laughs> I mean, it, is, it gets, just gets depressing. Does anybody else ever feel that way? You know something? It gets depressing. And so God had to keep reminding me, where's my focus? Where's my focus? And so this message came out of one of those thoughts. I was reading something by Billy Graham. I have not read a lot of Billy Graham until recently, and, and it really has expanded my, uh, my admiration, if you will, for Billy Graham. So I want to read you a quote. And uh, the title of the message is Our Hope and Stay, Our Hope and Stay. And I didn't give the guys in the booth um, my passage, but it's Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 5, 1 through 5. You don't have to pull that up now, but Our Hope and Stay. Billy Graham said this. He said, many years ago, I was visiting the dining room of the United States Senate. Kind of interesting, huh? He said, as I was speaking to various people, one of the senators said, Billy, we're having a discussion about pessimism and optimism. And he asked Billy Graham, are you a pessimist or an optimist? Billy Graham smiled and said, I'm an optimist. And the senator asked why. Billy Graham replied, because I've read the last page of the Bible, and the Bible speaks about a heavenly city whose builder and maker is God, where those who have been redeemed will be superior to angels. Let that sink in for a second. It speaks of a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It says there shall be no night there. They need no lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord gives them their light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Wow, that's a good answer. Optimism. Billy Graham said he was an optimist because of what God's Word tells him, what God's Word tells us about heaven, about God's promises for us and to us, about how God is preparing a place for us. He's an optimist. Billy Graham's hope and stay is the same hope and stay that our hope and stay is. It's on the very promises of God's Word. It's on the very promise that we got when we were first redeemed by Jesus Christ, when we first took Him as our Savior. I don't know about you, but the more I realize it, I really knew very little when I accepted Christ as Savior. I had no idea what a great deal that is. And the older I get, the more I understand what a great deal I got. My reason for talking about this very specifically is about our focus. 
And it's very simple. We represent Christ. You've heard it said. How many have heard it said? Yeah, you may be the Bible, some, somebody, the only Bible somebody ever reads. You may be the only Jesus somebody ever sees. That may seem like a, a sacrilegious statement to you, but let me ask you something. We are here representing who? We're supposed to walk like him. They're supposed to be able to see him in us. And so our focus becomes very, very important to me. I am an ambassador to Christ, or for Christ to a lost and dying world. And I have to ask myself sometimes, how do I represent him? How do people see me? How do you represent him? How do people see you? I have to shut off talk radio. I listen to more praise and worship because I can get down. Listen, should a Christian be, should we have the type of testimony that's doom and gloom? A lost and dying world should see something in us that they want to know more about. And I'll tell you, sometimes it's hard because, listen, having the right focus doesn't change what's going on in the world, does it? No. So I'm not talking about changing the world. I'm just talking about our hope and stay, where our focus is. Okay? The passage that Billy Graham was speaking out of is Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. If you would, stand, and we'll honor God's word in the reading of God's word. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, uh, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his ser servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we ask you, Lord, bless the reading of your word. Bless this morning hour. Father, may your spirit move in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> Pessimism and optimism. Some of you that know me well know that I am more a what? No, you don't know me very well. My family does. I'm more of a what? Yeah, I tend to be more of a pessimist yeah, by, uh, by nature. Um, but you know, the Word of God, and, and I've dealt with this a lot, people will come to me, news will come out. You know, obviously we've heard some very tragic news out of New York. And people will talk to me. Some of that news is very hard to understand. I got a little baby's feet up here. You know, some of that news is hard to take, isn't it? But you know, I find that the more I'm bathed in God's word, the more I understand the promises that he gave me, the more I understand that he is the great I am and in charge, it's not so much that the things in the world change, it's just my viewpoint. My optimism changes. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Billy Graham, man, it's like, you know, if somebody asked me that, I could, how could you possibly have that kind of response prepared? But he did. And it just raises my respect for him. In this passage of Scripture, we read that we will never thirst again. And I'm not talking about a Pepsi or a Coke. I'm talking about thirst for God. How many times have you thirsted for God? Not just God's word, but maybe praying for God and you feel like, you know, you're, you're sitting there and you're praying, you're pouring out your heart to God and you hear the doink where you're like your prayers bounce off the ceiling, come right back at you. Anybody ever felt that way? Thirst for God. We will never thirst for God again. We will see him face to face and we will serve him there. We will never hunger. I don't know about you, but commercials kill me. You guys see those commercials of the hungry children and stuff? Doesn't that just break your heart? There'll be no hunger there. There will never be any sick there. Again, you see the Shriners Hospitals commercials or the cleft palate commercials of those little kids. No sickness there. We will never be lonely. You know, sometimes you can feel very alone in a crowd of people. There are people that come to this church that feel like they don't measure up with the rest of the people that are here. That shouldn't be, should it? 
that won't be there. It will never be dark. Was it Stan that said your little toe was to rearrange furniture in the dark? I think that was Stan, wasn't it? Yeah. I think I broke both of them. They're now both rolled over onto their side when I walk, you know. It will never be dark. You will never hear a noise and wonder what is that. We will never be cold. Kind of appropriate for right now, isn't it? Never thinking about, boy, the oil truck's backing up. I wonder how much this is going to hit me for. We will be there having fellowship with a God that loves us more than we can comprehend. So, Christian, I ask you a question. Who has more reasons to be an optimist than us? I didn't hear any amens on that. We do. We do. I'm going to peruse through God's Word, and I want to show you some reasons because it's important. Our testimony to a lost and dying world is extremely important. And how we handle the hills and valleys that life gives us is part of our testimony. How we see and understand the gut-wrenching things that are going on sometime, and yet have an optimism about the things that God has promised us, the things that Jesus told us, the things that we obtained when we became saved that are our faith right now, but soon they'll be our eyes, that's important. Turn, if you will, to, with me for uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to probably give you some verses that you've heard before. We're probably going to talk about some things that you have talked about before. You heard your pastor talk about before, but Paul said, I'm going to remind you of some things, although you already know them. It's good for us to be reminded. It's good for us to just wash in God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says this. It says, but as it is written... I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor it hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us, here's God's promises, by the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. You know, I don't know about you, but I've traveled some. I've gone, driven through recently the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, my family and I went through that in a 34-foot camper. My wife was very disparaging every time I tried to look around at the valley and say, you know, what, how beautiful the things are that God has made. I've traveled. I've done safari in South Africa. I've seen some of the beautiful things of this world that God has made. And some of you have probably done Disney, some of the, seen some of the things that man has made. Right? God's Word says to us that we've never seen anything like He's preparing for us. It says we've never heard anything like he's prepared for us. Sometimes worship songs just choke me right up and I can't sing. I can remember being down in D.C. with 1.2 million men singing hymns to our Lord. Praise and worship to our Lord. That was powerful. I can remember when we were coming back from that, uh, there was uh, men stuffed into the subway systems and there was balconies on both sides and the subways were down below and one side of the subway men were yelling, we love Jesus, yes we do, we love Jesus, how about you? And the other side was echoing. The Bible says we've never heard anything like what we'll hear in heaven. That's amazing. It says we can't even imagine what God has prepared for us, for those that love him. We're going to keep on this theme. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Just a few pages over. Tried to make this in order so it would be somewhat easy for us. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. This might be one of my favorite promises. It says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am also known. Have you ever stopped to think about this? That in that day, it says, we will really know everyone and we will really be known by everyone. If you stop to ponder, that's a deep well. There'll be no false heirs, okay? No illusions or posturing, no lying, no maneuvering, no disingenuousness. Does that sound like heaven? Amen? I'll light a fire here long enough. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. 
It says, and we have borne the image of the earthly. Right now we're bearing the image of the earthly. Stan is feeling the pain bearing the image of the earthly right now. But then we shall bear the image of the heavenly. You know, God's word says that things are going to change. Things are going to change in my body. And I'm going to bear the image of the heavenly. Drop over to verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You ever feel like you're just spinning your wheels? Huh? You know, sometimes, you, you know, you're working on something in your faith. Maybe it's your temper or patience or whatever it is. And you feel like you've taken two steps forward. And next thing you know, you're taking three back. Right? Amen? Anybody been there? Our labor is not in vain. Our labor is not in vain. 2 Corinthians 5.1. 2 Corinthians. I love to hear those pages turned. The way we change our focus... The way we become more optimistic is to be bathed in the Word of God. It says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tabernacle, were, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. My new home in heaven is eternal. Nothing fades or wears out. I don't know about you, but I've got a love-hate relationship with my house. Mostly I hate it. Right? Every time you go to do something, right, you find out it's 10 times worse than you ever thought it was. You need to buy all kinds of more product, and, it, and whatever it is you're working on is going to be down a lot longer than you thought it was going to be. My heavenly home is not like that. There's no taxes. There's no furnace to quit. I'm not worried about my roof or a coat of paint. It's e eternal. Turn with me to John, the book of John. It's not all in order. Book of John, chapter 14. It's amazing to me that God loved us so that he gave us his word. John chapter 14. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believed in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto me but by the Father. Nobody cometh unto the Father but by me. The part I want to point out here is that this verse tells us our eternal home is as secure as God is himself. Our eternal home is as secure as God himself. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I will go prepare a place for you. I will come again and get you. It's as secure as the God we know. That's amazing. But it's there, you've heard this saying before, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. That's hard to say this morning, I didn't have my coffee. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. It's there for those that have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It's there for people that have realized that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I can't make a way to get there myself. I'm just not good enough. Never can be, never will be. Jesus paid that price for me. And because of that, heaven's a prepared place for me. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, right after Ephesians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, it says, For our conversation is in heaven. That word conversation there is citizenship. Citizenship. You know, this isn't popular sometimes. Sometimes we get so caught up in being an American that we forget being part of the body of Christ is much larger than just being a Christian American. Okay? My citizenship is not here. This is the country God gave me, and I love it. We're to be great stewards of it, okay? The Bible's very clear. We're to pray for our leaders. We're to pay our taxes. But this is not my home. Sometimes we watch the news, and we can get in so much anguish over what's going on in our country, and I'm not saying that that's not justified. What I am saying on the other side of that, though, is this is not my home. 
I have another citizenship. I am traveling, if you will. And soon, God's going to call me home. The things that I can't change, the things that I can't handle, are no problem for my Lord God Creator. They're no problem for my Redeemer. And this reminds me of that. Billy Graham said his hope and stay, our hope and stay, is what God's Word promises for us, for our futures. But we're also reminded we still have the now, don't we? Right? People look around, they think, you know, God must be coming back. Jesus must be coming back. He must be coming back soon. But we still have that time between here, where I am right now, and when He comes for me. Turn to James chapter 5, if you would. Right after Hebrews, James chapter 5. Because I think this is all part of our focus and how we're to live. James chapter 5. I want to pick up the reading in verse 8. James chapter 5, verse 8. Love to hear the pages of God's Word. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Take my brethren the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. In other words, you saw what Job was patient through, and you saw how God took care of him. Okay? As I look at this, I'm reminded of what I need to focus on right now. Well, my focus is obviously on going home, on Jesus calling me home. But there's a nearer horizon that I need to focus on as well. And that nearer horizon tells me that I need to be stable, that I need to be patient, that I need to have my heart established. It's interesting to me because this is a great part of our testimony, isn't it? It's a great part of what we've just been saying. When I hear news, is my heart established? What's my heart staying on? Am I patient? Am I enduring? These are keys. God's word tells us that Jesus is coming again and that his coming is assured just as a farmer waits for his crops. It's coming. But patience and an established heart are keys for my testimony. They're keys for us. We know he's going to come and complete his promises, but until then, are we established? Are our hearts established on his word? Do we show a peace and a patience, a confidence that we know Jesus Christ is coming back for us? Because this is part of our testimony that a world that is kind of looking around and kind of freaking out over stuff, they're watching. And they're watching you, Christian. They're watching you as... The economy and the country goes through certain things, but you know what? They're also watching you as you personally go through some things. They want to see how you go through those things. They want to see if you handle the low blows that life gives you differently than they handle them because they want to know if you have something that they should have. James says while we're waiting on God, on Jesus' return, he has some guidelines for us, doesn't he? Grudge not one against another. It reminds us also, you know, we're here as God's family. And he says, don't be grumbling against one another as you wait. He says, brethren, grudge not against one another. He says, lest ye be condemned, behold, the judge standeth at the door. You know, there's, there's a balance here. There's all of the promises of God's word that I put my faith into and that I'm looking forward to, that I probably like you, don't feel worthy someday to have my faith be my eyes, my sight. But there's another part where Jesus comes back. And he's getting us, yes, for all of those promises, but he's also going to ask us something. He's going to say, look, with the gifts and the talents I gave you, with the people that I surrounded you with, how much did you reflect me? How much of a witness, if you were the only Jesus that person sees, how well did we portray him? Right? If you were the only Bible, if I'm the only Bible somebody reads, there's going to be an accounting for that. And so am I an optimistic? I'm, well, I'm, I'm better. I'm better. I'm more optimistic now than I was. But at the same time, I have to understand there's an accounting. 
And it's interesting to me that he, as he looks at this, the first thing he talks about is how the family functions inside the family. How we function about each other. Are we busy judging one another? Or are we busy loving on one another? Are we grumbling and complaining about each other? The Bible says we're to edify, we're to lift up. Okay? Picture that like this. If there's anything that I can do to encourage my brother down the road to be more like Christ, I'm lifting him up. That's edification. Anything I can do for a brother or sister, a kind word, a quick word of prayer, a note, a card, how you doing, and really mean how you doing, not how you doing while you keep walking. Okay? Edification. It's the opposite of all of this stuff, right? And he says, you know, Jesus is coming back and he's going to judge our works. We're told here that endurance will be rewarded, that he will come for us, and that he has promised, everything that he's promised to us, will be rewarded with. I don't know about you, but I really can't, uh, I'm not sure if I've got a good understanding of that. I see it, it excites me, it changes me to be a little more optimistic, but I couldn't tell you a great deal about it. We are reminded here that the facts of God, in, 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 of the facts of God's endurance and everlasting compassion towards us and His great mercy in dealing with us. This passage of Scripture reminds us how God endures with us. The older I get, the more words like grace and mercy and long-suffering mean to me. Because obviously, like you, the longer God puts up with me, the more grace and mercy and long-suffering He needs to, to put up with me. Amen? Yeah, I hope you meant yourself, not me, but... Okay? But those are not just aspects of God that we should be coveting and thankful for. They should be aspects of God that we are displaying, reflecting. You know, if, if somebody is going to see Jesus in me, it's not going to be Mark acting like Mark normally acts or my, like Mark naturally acts. It's going to be when I'm displaying the grace and mercy of God, when I'm displaying the long-suffering of God that He's shown to me, when I'm displaying that, that's when they're seeing somebody that's not me. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's when they see our Savior. Why? Because they know that's not natural. That's not me. That's not who I am. Here the Bible says we're to be steadfast, we're to be stable, we're to have our hearts established. How do you do that? You know, I've, I've spoken on this before. Jesus said, I leave you peace. I leave you joy. And he said, I don't leave this to you like the world leaves to you. So how do you do that? And you know, the, ampl the answer, honestly, is simple. We have to be bathed in the Word of God. The only way to have your heart established is to truly spend time in God's Word and to truly have a perspective that is above the perspective of the flesh and the world to have a perspective that reminds us on a daily basis, I'm going to put God first, give Him time first, pray with Him this morning, think about Him, give Him the adoration He deserves, give others the prayer, you know, the lifting up, right, that they deserve. I'm going to pray for my pastor, I'm going to pray for other people that I know, things that are going on, right? And then I'm going to spend time in God's Word. And I'm going to spend time in God's Word because that's the only way I can be an optimist and have a proper focus in life. Unmovable. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, We know God's word and we can stand on his promises. Why? Because he guarantees them. Always abounding in good works. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. You know, Jesus is coming back and soon. How is our understanding of God's word and God's promises? And is it showing in our testimony? Are we showing a lost and dying world the peace and joy of knowing Jesus and His promises? And are we showing them that these promises are secure in Him and that He's coming again soon for us all? You know, honestly, this is something that should make up us optimistic. And dare I say, even as a Baptist, is that something to be excited about? Is it? That's Baptist excitement right there. That is. Yeah, I get it. Amen. Woo. I guess because I'm a pessimist by heart, 
my focus and where it's been has been on my mind a lot lately. I feel like God's been working on my heart a lot about that lately. And I'll tell you something, if we don't give God our first fruits of who we are as far as our time and our prayer and being in God's word, there's a, a psalm that talks about being under his wing and there's a hymn that talks about it too. And that thought has been on my mind a lot lately. I need to tuck myself under his wing and I need to abide there. And when I'm doing that, I'm much more likely to be optimistic. I'm much more likely to show somebody God's word in my life. But if I get so wound up in schedule or what's going on and I'm not in God's word and I'm not praying like I should, I'm much more apt just to show people Mark. And honestly, showing people Mark saves nobody. Right? We're going to bow and have a word of prayer. We're going to have um, an altar time. We always do with this church. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that we can come here and pray. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Pastor Scott's going to be right down front. He'd be a great guy for you to meet and get to know, and he'd love to talk to you about that. If you'd like to join the church, if you just want to come down and pray, whatever you want to do, this is the time to give God parts of your first fruit, right? Talk to him about what's on your heart, about what you think he'd like to change in you, right? Progressive sanctification. We're all on that road someplace. And we're all trying to get a little further down the road. I want you to come and do that. I'm going to be sneaking out back. We're going to have a baptism. We're going to be baptizing three this morning. Praise the Lord. Tonight, we're going to be in Psalm 90. Okay? And we're going to have a discussion. And it's going to center around Moses' words that God is from everlasting to everlasting. So hope you come back tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for your promises, Father. It's amazing how much you love us and how much you've done for us and how much you're doing for us and how much you will do for us. Father, I just pray, Lord, that we would bathe ourselves in your word, that we'd tuck ourselves under your wing and that we would abide there. I pray, Father, that you'd help us all to be optimists, that we understand the last page of the Bible, just like Billy Graham said, and now his faith is his eyes. He's there with you, and soon that will be for us. Father, we pray that that optimism would, would just eke through us and that people could see our Savior in us. Father, I pray that you'd have your will and way at this altar time, that if we need to get something straight with you, that we'd be willing to get out and come down and do so. Pray for anyone that's lost, Lord, that they could make their way down front and talk to Pastor Scott. Father, we love you. We're so unworthy of all of the promises you've given us, all of the things that you've already done for us. And yet that just tells us what an awesome God you are. It's your great love for us. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our Savior and the precious Holy Spirit that comes and abides in us. Father, thank you. Be with this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.